Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our first ever EF Campus Student Showcase. Um, we're really excited today for all of you to hear from the undergraduate research assistants who have been participating in the inaugural year of Environmental Frontiers Campus um, and contributing to a wide array of research to support uh, campus sustainability planning. Um, so let me do, before I hand it over to some of our speakers, uh, I'll do a quick orientation of um, where we're gonna go today. Let me just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Great, oops. Um, so here's uh, what we're going to cover. Uh, it'll be um, a quick kind of introduction from our faculty leads on environmental frontiers, Sabina Sheikh and Elizabeth Moyer. Uh, we'll then hear from collaborators at the uh, at facility services um, about their participation in environmental frontiers campus and how they've been helping to work with these students and oversee and guide the research. Uh, and then we'll hear from our students uh, on three different areas of analysis that they've done. Um, one is on Leonard uh, Labs energy consumption. The next is lead building benchmarking and final is water conservation measures. Uh, if you do have questions, I encourage you to use the chat throughout. Um, and, you know, so the students, you know, in between each presentation area, uh, We'll also take a few moments to, to answer questions, but then we'll have Q&A and open conversation at the end as well. Um, so with that, let me hand it over to uh, Professor Sheikh and Moyer to say a bit more about uh, Environmental Frontiers. Who do you want to go first? Um, go ahead, Liz. So um, I'm a faculty in the Department of Geophysical Sciences. Um, I teach a class uh, routinely in, in energy technology, which I started because I felt like we don't have an engineering school and students need to know more. Um, I also run a program called the Center for Robust Decision-Making on Climate and Energy Policy. And out of both of those efforts um, came this sort of interest in figuring out in a university without an engineering school, how do we train undergraduates in the sort of practices and the knowledge they'll need to go out and work in sustainability um, in a realistic way. So, so, you know, the nitty gritty of what they need to know. And so this program, my involvement here sort of stemmed out of a couple years of efforts, including something that we previously called Campus as a Lab. And now it's becoming a bigger and bigger thing where we try to pair students with uh, both faculty, but most importantly, staff in the facilities department to work on sort of real world projects. And you'll hear from a bunch of the students today who've been through the program. And the goal is to get people doing projects that lead to actionable decisions to show you what it really takes um, you know, to make a decision that helps save energy, uh, what the considerations are. And we have fabulous staff members um, uh, in facilities who've been willing to work with students. And the students have actually made a really big impact in terms of saving energy and costs. And Sabina Scheich, who's coming after me, um, is also, so it's been great to connect with Mansueto. And Sabina runs the program on the global environment, um, which has been spearheading these kind of efforts for a long time. So I'll turn it over to Sabina. Thanks, Liz, and um, welcome everybody. I, I just want to reiterate everything that Liz said, and it's it's been um, a long time in the making, and we're grateful to the Mensuedo Institute and um, all the staff from Facility Services and Sustainability, as well as all of our student researchers, who you'll soon see have done great work. Um, it, you know, related to the research, I also teach course a course on water. I'm teaching it right now. And um, I taught a course related to waste before, where we've teamed up with the facilities services um, folks who provided us with campus data. So it's another opportunity to work, um, do analysis with campus data, campus sustainability data through courses. Um, but I will uh, stop talking and turn it over to the students who have um, done all the work to, to share with you today. Thanks everyone. And the students have done marvelous stuff. I'm gonna drop off, but I can come back for questions when the students are done, if you wanna to talk to us, but I think the students were the most relevant people. Great, thank you so much, Liz.
a quick interlude from uh, Sarah Popenhagen, sustainability manager at um, Facility Services, to kind of help uh, our audience understand the larger campus sustainability efforts and initiatives within which these students are doing their analysis and how it all kind of connects and ties together. Sarah? Hey, thank you, Diana. My name is Sarah Popenhagen. I'm with the Office of Sustainability and Facility Services, and it's so great to see you all here today. Really excited to be a part of this. So um, my office, I collaborate with the Mansueto Institute on Environmental Frontiers at NEF campus. And what we are working on is projects that support the goals in our sustainability plan, which is available on our website at the link that's at the bottom of the slide. So our plan has nine different areas of um, focus. And like I said, everything we're doing is in support of this sustainability plan. So for example, area nine at the bottom right is a building awareness and partnerships. And that is working with students, faculty, and staff on actual projects like Professor Moyer mentioned. And so that's one of the things that we're doing at EF campus is we're all collaborating together on actual projects on our campus that su support the rest of our sustainability goals here in this plan. And so one of the most important goals that we're very focused on is area one, climate change and energy. And our goal there is to reduce our campus greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. That's a new goal that was announced a year ago, last Earth Day. And we know that approximately 70% of our emissions come from our campus buildings from natural gas and electricity usage. And that leads us to area two, high performance buildings. So we are very focused on energy conservation measures and other things that we can do to reduce our energy and have our buildings perform as designed and perform better. And so that leads to a project that we're working on called Green Labs. And that's something we're currently working on with EF Campus because we know that our labs are very energy intensive. So we're working on ways to improve that so we can reduce energy usage in our labs. So hence the Green Labs project with EF Campus. Um, another area of focus that we started working on is water conservation, area seven. And we have recently established a water use profile for the university from fiscal years 2013 to the present basically, we're still working on the most current data, but now we have an idea of what our water usage looks like on campus. And so another EF campus project that we have is working on a water use reduction plan. So we can determine how can we meet our water conservation goals? What projects are we gonna do? And then we can implement that plan. So we are in the planning stages and that is a project we're working on with EF campus. Additionally, we collaborate with Dr. Sheck and her water class that she has this uh, quarter. And like she said, we've provided water data for the class to work with to help us collaborate on ideas and findings that the students may have in the class. And another thing I wanna briefly mention is we have, recently updated our sustainability website. We have two new tabs on the website. One is energy. And there's a ton of information on that tab and I um, highly encourage you to take a look at it. One of the things that you'll see there is energy dashboards have been posted. So that's really interesting to look at. Um, additionally, there's a new tab regarding events. And you'll see quite a few events posted there now for Earth Week and going forward for you to get involved in. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and again, that's sustainability.uchicago.edu. Thank you, Diana. Great, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there are a couple of other facilities colleagues um, here uh, in the room, uh, Adam D'Ambrosio and Ryan Hoff, who is similar to Sarah, have been critical in making all of this possible. And so we're really grateful for, for their guidance and mentorship um, and, and iterations with the students. So with that, um, I'm excited to turn it over to our labs team, Eric Chen, Shapnavo, Biswas, and Ryan Cutter. Um, and with that, Eric and Shop, please take it away. All right, good morning. 
Um, so I'm Eric. I was on. I was a member of the uh, labs team over the summer. And just a first, a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we'll talk about some of the key details about what it's like to work in a Chicago lab and why it takes up so much energy. Some findings from the summer regarding how much energy labs actually use. Recommendations for cutting down and conserving. Um, and then we'll also pivot into some behavioral change campaigns uh, that the lab team is working on now. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so first, a quick overview of, of lab, uh, lab details. So labs, lab buildings around campus use up a disproportionately high amount of energy when compared to their um, building area. So there's 10 total lab buildings on campus, at which take up 10% of building area, but use around 40% of energy. Um, there's a few reasons for this. One is the high ventilation requirement. Um, it's because there's like experiments going on in labs, which means that there the air in buildings needs to be circulated fairly often. Um, something that drives this ventilation energy use is um, our fume hoods. Uh, there's a picture of fume hood in the bottom left corner. Um, and another contributor to the high energy requirement in labs is cold storage. Um, and in the bottom left, there's also a picture of a ultra low temperature freezer. Um, to provide some context for like which lab buildings use up the most energy, um, in the top right, there's a graph of the biggest energy users um, and it's GCIS, ERC and Searle, which use um, the top, which are the top three energy consumers for labs. Um, and so before we move forward, we thought it'd be also helpful to habituate uh, ourselves to some uh, words that we'll see again and again when we discuss energy usage, especially in labs. Um, so the first is intensity, and this refers to sort of any quantity that we scale uh, per building unit area. So we don't talk about sort of energy usage in building, we talk about uh, the energy intensity of a certain building. Um, so it's how much energy it uses scaled by its area. And this, let this, this, let, this lets us compare the energy efficiency of buildings directly, if, even if they're different sizes. Um, here at UChicago, it's also helpful to distinguish between the BSD versus PSD for biological science versus phys physical sciences division, um, which have different requirements on um, their energy usage. Um, as Shot mentioned earlier, um, a, a key, some key equipment that goes into, that drives a lot of energy usage on campus are fume hoods and cold storage. And so fume hoods, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, fume hoods are a device that we use to, uh, to conduct certain uh, chemical or biological experiments. Um, and they consistently, constantly ventilate um, the air and the setting around which the, the uh, experiment is taking place. And so there's a high demand on, um, uh, on ventilation and energy usage. Uh, from fume hoods, um, and there are different types that we can get into um, a, li a little bit later. Finally, uh, sorry, next, um, there's cold storage and what we call ULTs or ultra low temperature storage, um, especially important in biological labs where there are certain precious samples uh, like DNA, RNA, or enzymes that need to be stored at temperatures as low as minus 80 or minus 70 degrees Celsius. And finally, HVAC, uh, something that all buildings share, um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, refers to just uh, the sort of uh, ventilation requirements of a particular building. So now I'll talk about some of our key findings from the summer. So one of our key areas of research was the ventilation rate that we mentioned earlier. Um, from pure ventilation practices, we see that UChicago ventilates at a higher rate um, uniformly, with, as in during occupied hours and un unoccupied hours. And in contrast to other institutions which adjust ventilation rates based on occupancy status, like whether the building is occupied or not, um, Chicago ventilates their buildings at a constant rate, regardless of occupancy status. Another area of research for us was fume hoods. Um, from this graph, it's pretty clear that fume hoods, uh, the bar in Navy is a or contribute to like a majority of energy use across lab buildings. Um, we also investigated how many fume hoods there are at UChicago compared to lab buildings nationally. And in the graph in the bottom right, we see that Searle, Kent, and Jones have a higher fume hood density than most, build, most comparable lab buildings nationally. Um, another major another major driver of electricity use uh, is plug loads um, uh, or different types of equipment that also use energy. And so these are the bars that are not in the navy blue. 
Um, and they're driven by things like ultra low temperature freezers, desktops, and labs, lab specific equipment like incubators, shakers, centrifuges, and ovens. And they make up a non trivial amount of energy on campus. In some buildings, it, it is around 5%. For mo but for most buildings, uh, U Chicago, or for most laboratories at U Chicago, they can take up between 20 to 50% of overall electricity use. Um, and within that, it's also especially meaningful to focus on ultra low temperature storage which accounts for approximately 15% of energy of electricity use in the biological sciences department. Um, we've identified certain labs, uh, certain labs that uh, have the greatest density of ultra low temperature freezers. Um, and our research also shows that uh, although the convention is to set freezers to minus 80 degrees Celsius, setting one to minus 70 degrees Celsius actually saves um, substantial uh, electricity use um, and is similarly effective uh, at preserving uh, samples that have to be kept in ultra cold conditions. Great. So based on those findings, um, we want to talk about the recommendations that we made last summer. Um, so the first area was about the ventilation rate. Um, there's a few different ways to lower the energy cost associated with ventilating a building. Um, one of them, and perhaps the most widespread among um, other universities is to adjust the ventilation rate based on occupancy status. Um, the first step in that would be to run a risk assessment by the Office of Research Safety to evaluate how feasible it is to reduce ventilation rate at um, in New Chicago buildings based on like building specifics. Um, and another step into this in this would be to determine the occupancy hours if New Chicago were to eventually adjust their ventilation rates dynamically. For fume hoods, um, another driver of ventilation, um, there's a few different ways to lower the energy cost of fume hoods. Uh, fume hoods, like the energy cost of fume hoods comes from the fact that they have to cycle a certain amount of air. And the way to save energy is to reduce the amount of air that they're cycling. Um, one of the ways is to install fume hoods with auto closure, that is fume hoods that will lower the sash automatically when they are not in use. Um, there's also a more behavioral campaign angle to take with fume hoods, which is to put up flyers and stickers, basically just trying to remind lab users to shut their fume hood sash whenever it's not in use. Um, so our main recommendations in the short term would be to extend the current such shut the sash campaign that was in Searle to GCIS East, which we found was the building with the highest number of fume hoods. Um, <clears throat> next, we also uh, explored ways to target um, the high plug load um, of different campus laboratories. Um, and so there, there are two uh, main uh, prongs of our, of our recommendation for addressing plug, plug loads. Um, the first is to uh, increase awareness among researchers themselves about equipment best practices to extend the lifetime of different equipment and to use them the most efficient way possible. And the next is to also implement a system for uh, retiring, consolidating, or recycling old unused equipment between different labs. Um, and because this sort of management takes on different forms, we also explore different um, institutional uh, ways of implementing uh, plug load based campaigns. Um, and so we compare different quote green labs programs at different uh, peer institutions such as UC Boulder, uh, UCSB, Harvard, Yale, um, UC Berkeley, um, as well as the actions of, an, of a sort of national decentralized nonprofit um, called Mind Green Lab that, that partners with individual university faculty and, and, and individual labs to sort of coordinate uh, green lab uh, efforts that include uh, things targeted at plug loads. So here we have like a summary basically of our recommendations across our four areas of research. Um, we can come back to this slide, but in the interest of time, we want to move on to the behavioral change campaign um, that we're working on currently. So I'll take it from here as I'm kind of a, a new member. So over the fall, there was kind of a pause on uh, the labs energy team, but Starting in winter quarter, we came back and uh, myself, Shop, and Yasmina are now the kind of labs energy team. So based on all of the different 
work in the summer and the, and the recommendations found by that team, the workflow that we've established now is divided into pretty much two streams. We have the lab decision-making tool and the behavioral change campaign. And so for in, in the winter quarter, um, the lab decision-making tool was established as uh, a tool that's going to help uh, new, new labs, whether it's an incoming faculty member or just somebody looking to, to make a, a new research lab. Um, and it, it focuses on key equipment types. So the things that they were mentioning, like the fume hoods and the ULTs, which are really intense energy users, um, those are the things that we really want to focus on with this tool because they have the most potential to lower lab energy consumption and it really promotes efficiency when purchasing these new equipment. And um, for the behavioral change campaign, it was also part of those recommendations on you know, reducing plug load and shutting the sash that uh, was used in the summer report and was then turned into, you know, how are we gonna actually make it happen at U Chicago? Um, so we defined the most impactful areas for the energy consumption habits to change and then went on to research uh, archetypes and, and key factors that create successful behavioral change campaigns like those used at other universities. And then moving into spring quarter, uh, the outlook is now to continue building out our lab decision-making tool, um, really you know, getting into the nitty gritty on inputs and calculations on energy use, um, adding lighting to the array of tool, array of equipment that is in the tool. And the main focus is really on functionality and delivering clear and useful outputs because that's really what's going to change uh, the energy consumption in a lab. Uh, and with the behavioral change campaign, we're looking to you know, prepare and deliver an action plan that goes through all the steps of monitoring and, and starting a potential campaign strategy. And uh, now I'd just like to say that you know, EF Campus for me has been uh, a really powerful uh, way of, of, of concretely applying my interest in sustainability. And uh, it's really influenced my decision to pursue these issues on energy and sustainability, especially in urban settings. And, you know, in terms of skills that this program has offered, it, it really instilled my confidence uh, to own my work and to, you know, build consensus among diverse stakeholders, which is a pretty tough thing to do. But luckily, we get the chance to work on it here. Great, thank you so much, Eric Schaap and Ryan. Really fantastic work. Uh, I wanna give a few moments if there are questions from the audience for um, these three students at, or just broadly about labs energy on campus. I guess I have a question for Ryan. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so Ryan, you were talking about like stakeholder management and kind of applying the conclusions. What what do you think you learned in terms of, of managing the stakeholders? Like what interests were balanced and how did you go about getting input and getting buy-in from different groups of interest on campus? Yeah, so when I started back in February, um, we kind of have this array of different people, like including, you know, the people from facility services here today, faculty like Liz and Sabina, um, where each kind of has their own perspective about what really happens. Like facility services is informed by, you know, what are like the just kind of logistical limitations and do we have the ability to even like get certain data on, on different processes? Like what is the actual building potential? And then you have faculty members who are more interested in, you know, how does a, a faculty member like occupy that space and use that space? And so it's all about figuring out the best way to align all of those goals and, and the interests of the different groups. And it's still a work in progress, I would say, but um, always trying to align those goals is, is really the, the guiding uh, vision. Awesome, thanks. Can I ask a, it's part question, um, part statement. I was wondering if you all, and when you were looking at any of these buildings noticed um, any correlation with the building's age and anything like um, LEED certification and if that was part of your analysis and if you were, and if so, you know, how were you, 
what did you find? And did you find that the building age or the building sort of level of supposed greenness were, were related to the way it was actually being used? I can try to answer that. Um, when you say building age, um, there was one finding which was about, there's, there's sort of like two types of fume hoods that uh, labs often use. Um, one is far more efficient than the other. And we found that some of the older buildings on campus were using the less efficient version while it's pretty much standard that in newer buildings, they would install um, the more efficient one. Um, and to your question about LEED certification, I think that we had it, we were working, there was another team working on that last summer. So I think we'll definitely get to that um, later in this presentation. Um, thank you again, uh, Eric Schaub and Ryan. And in fact, we'll get to lead right now. Very good segue all. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Yasmina uh, Sesek and Mark uh, Siedentop. Uh, who were our lead team last summer. They, as um, Shot mentioned, Yasmina has now joined labs and Mark is currently working on water conservation, but we're excited for them to share uh, their lead uh, analysis that they did. So Yasmina and Mark, please take it away. So hello everybody, I'm Mark and Yasmina will be joining me on this presentation. And we're here to just talk a little bit about the, what we did past summer on lead buildings on UChicago's campus. At the beginning, we weren't really too sure. Oh, I'm sorry, can you go back just one slide for a moment, please? Um, so at the beginning, we weren't really too sure the exact direction that looking at these unique buildings was going to take us as none of us had any prior experience with um, lead or other certification systems. But we were led by the following question of Will LEED certification help the University of Chicago meet its 2030 target to reduce annual carbon emissions by 50%? So the rest of this is kind of just discussing um, what we the information that we found when looking for an answer to this question. So kind of to kick things off, um, what is LEED? LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design and is the most commonly used green building rating system throughout the world. When becoming LEED certified, buildings have to attain points in different categories that range from energy usage to the materials used in construction and to even having to consider the site of the building, such as its accessibility to something like public transportation. And the more points these buildings achieve, the higher their lead rating goes, starting from certified to silver to gold and finally to platinum, which is the most difficult rating to earn as you have to earn most of the points throughout all of these broad categories, which can also become quite costly. And so now to give you a bit of a big picture overview of lead on the UChicago campus, we currently have 18 lead certified or higher buildings but we only have 12 with complete data. So that was where most of our focus um, lied over the summer. And when looking at these buildings, we got to see some specific insight on how attaining points in specific categories led to improvements in the sustainability of these buildings and how that sort of related to the energy usage. And what we found throughout the study was that even though there is a category such called energy and atmosphere, um, there isn't really too much within the lead process that dives specifically into the energy usage of the buildings themselves. And we'll discuss that a little bit later in the presentation. But what I mean by that is just that when becoming lead certified, um, you know, ener the energy process is somewhat involved as we have to submit an energy model. However, that's basically just computer simulations rather than what's actually going to occur uh, when the building goes online. And we were able to come up with some specific data that also showed there was somewhat of a relationship between the level of certification and the amount of energy saved. However, it was difficult to truly say if, if these two were directly linked, but I feel like that's just important to mention as some of you may know for all new buildings on campus that are being built, there is sort of a requirement to achieve lead silver. And uh, we see that obviously as a very good thing and a very uh, positive start 
However, this might be able to be pushed a little bit further in terms of really placing an emphasis on reducing the energy usage of these buildings that are currently being built on campus. So then here you can just see a map to kind of get an idea of where exactly these buildings are on campus. And we did get this pretty early on thanks to Yasmina. So it was really nice to just be able to visualize um, some of these buildings and their energy use intensity. And so now if you look, you can see that the size of the circle represents the source EUI of these buildings. And so the higher the EUI, the larger the circle would be. And I believe this kind of gets into the question that was just asked and following the presentation of Eric Schopp and Ryan, um, an observation that we made really early on was that the three lab buildings to the left of the map, um, they're really intense energy users, kind of just because of the activity that goes on inside of them. So even being LEED certified, um, there's still only so much that you can do to uh, reduce the energy usage before the actual activity of the building kind of plays a part in how much energy is being used. And so finally, our project went in three different phases. The initial benchmarking phase, uh, first, what we did was we looked at these lead buildings and compared them with other UChicago non-lead buildings, as well as City of Chicago buildings to just try to determine whether or not our lead buildings on campus were performing any better. And from this, we saw that the evidence suggested that this was not necessarily the case for our buildings and that in terms of them performing better than their non-lead counterparts and comparable buildings. And second, we wanted to look into why these buildings might not have been performing as they're expected to and saw that many of these buildings had really high targets on their lead applications, but after going online, they didn't necessarily meet these expectations, which again is somewhat due to uh, submitting a energy model on, on these applications that sometimes doesn't take into account some of the effects of the real world, as well as the fact that after these buildings go online, sometimes it just takes a while for the operations to uh, be performing smoothly and as they should be. And so that we, we also saw that certain types of lead projects, such as the operations and management project, did have noticeable differences in the energy use after the project was completed. However, this didn't always lead to long-term energy use reduction, and we saw those savings gradually um, decrease over time. And third, we tried to provide insights on how UChicago can continue to construct sustainable buildings beyond just LEED certification. And one of these was the Passive House certification, which focuses primarily on energy use within the building. And Yasmina will touch on that in just one moment. And we also saw that continuing to maintain and perform retrofits in these buildings, as well as non-LEED buildings is just really, uh, uh, important for improving the energy performance of these buildings. And that was one of our recommendations was for facilities to continue improving the FS2 sustainability tool, which they've done a great job on um, producing higher standards and just continuously doing these projects. And we think that'll really help um, along the road to continuing uh, uh, improving the performance in these UChicago buildings. So I'll talk um, a little bit more in depth about some of the things that Mark just mentioned. Um, starting with our initial findings when looking at the energy use of UChicago lead buildings in comparison to other buildings in Chicago. Um, from this graph, you can see that in general, UChicago lead buildings don't perform better than non-lead um, Chicago buildings, the black line. Um, over each grouping is the average energy use of non-lead buildings uh, separated out by type. And so after we found this, we wanted to look into why um, this was the case and from there, uh, potential ways to solve this. So next slide, please. So when, when thinking about why uh, these buildings are not 
performing very well, even though they're lead certified and supposed to use um, less energy than their non-lead counterparts. One thing that Mark mentioned was that the lead energy um, points come from a model that doesn't actually look at actual building use data because the model is done with computer simulations and it's created before that building is actually even put up or um, in use. And there are a number of things that contribute to uh, the energy consumption of a building, one of them being operations, maintenance, um, and then occupancy behavior. And so to address these two things based on our research, it seems like you know, frequent um, post-occupancy evaluations, recommissioning of systems, um, basically just frequent monitoring and improvement is really the key for uh, reducing the energy consumption of these buildings. And then in addition, it's really important to consider occupancy behavior because for example, um, occupants use things like computers, et cetera, which are uh, pretty energy intensive, especially uh, when considered throughout an entire building. So um, the, looking at those two things, which aren't really certification systems, actually seem to be really important for improving energy performance. And then the third thing that we looked at was uh, other types of certification systems, other types of lead certification. The operations and management certification that Mark mentioned was unique because they actually used um, the, the actual energy performance of a building uh, after it was online versus most other lead certifications which do not. However, we still found that these operations and management certified buildings don't seem to perform better. Uh, the other thing that we looked at was a passive house certification, which uh, is completely focused on energy. However, the, the one downside of that is there are obviously other things that contribute to sustainability other than energy, but it does seem like some of the uh, key points of passive house are important for um, you know, improving the energy consumption of these buildings. So kind of wrapping it all up to answer our original question about whether uh, LEED certification will help the university achieve its building goal. The answer seems to be that LEED certification isn't necessarily the best option. However, there are, you know, key points that LEED does address that are important to uh, look at. However, doing it through LEED certification isn't necessarily the best thing. Um, it might be better to kind of take a, um, an approach from uh, several different things such as like passive house certification for just the energy and then focusing on the building uh, post-construction. Great, thank you, Yasmina. And Mark, any audience questions about uh, lead buildings. Um, I have a, a quick question, which is you mentioned there's like six buildings you didn't have complete data for. Um, is there anything you'd be particularly interested in looking into for those six missing buildings if you could get more data in the future? Uh, like, is there anything about those six buildings that you're like, oh, we're missing this kind of piece because we just didn't have the data to look into it? Yeah, so um, the main one is the Keller Center. Uh, the reason we didn't have enough data for that is because it's brand new, uh, but it is the only platinum certified building on campus. Um, and so it would be really interesting to look into uh, that building's performance and see what that looks like in a few years. Great, thank you so much. Um, Mark and Yasmin, a really, really interesting work. Uh, next up is our water team, um, Jillian Gagnard, Ruby Rorty, and Anika Bott. Unfortunately, Jillian and Anika both had conflicts this morning, uh, so we'll be hearing from Ruby uh, to hold down the, the, the fort. So Ruby, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. 
So as Diana said, uh, we were the water team. So we spent this summer researching water conservation at UChicago under environmental frontiers. Also, as Diana said, my colleague, Jillian Gennard is out sick today. And so I have the pleasure and challenge of telling you our water story by myself. So this summer, Jillian and I were tasked with charting a plausible path to 15% reduction in water use for UChicago by 2025. So it's an ambitious goal, but we also see it as an opportunity for innovation. We are a university on a great lake at the heart of a watershed, and we are home to some of the world's greatest innovators and ideas. And we think that our water plan is reflected of those two facts. So to start our project, we just wanted to get a sense of the landscape of existing water conservation me measures in higher education. So for that, we looked at peer institutions in adjacent and our climate zones, so dealing with similar environmental circumstances, and that had stellar records of water conservation or overall really high sustainability rankings. We had a particular interest in looking at peer institutions of similar sizes and student bodies, and in particular Ivy Plus schools. And from this benchmarking process, what we really wanted to do is get a sense of who the stars in this field are, so we could delve deeper into the interventions they're implementing and see how they might apply to UChicago. So this graph shows um, the sort of benchmarking landscape we came up with in terms of overall consumption of water. So you can see from this chart, uh, UChicago is doing pretty well. We're kind of in the middle there. Here, the um, black marker re uh, represents the total consumption in the baseline year, whereas the maroon shows the consumption during a performance year. So our takeaway here was basically that we were able to identify schools that independent of their sustainability record or water conservation on paper, really did have a track record of um, low, either low water consumption or significant water consumption reduction. But we still wanted to sort of delve deeper into benchmarking. And so we also created the uh, next slide to create a different visualization. So this graph shows overall reduction in gallons per square foot. So we wanted to account in differences in size and student body of varying schools. And this gave us a clear perspective on who the real stars were and who we could be looking to for inspiration for water saving interventions. As you can see here, University of Chicago is the maroon line. That's our um, sort of reduction uh, benchmark from the past few years. And then we have on the x-axis uh, peer institutions from adjacent climate zones that have really, in, in many cases, very successful water conservation. And so a particular note to us were Stanford, Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and um, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and Case Western Reserve. And so looking at those schools that really stood out in our benchmarking process gave us the opportunity to investigate further what their policies are, what uh, innovations they're using for water conservation to explore how those might apply to UChicago. To do this, we uh, talked to a whole range of experts from people at the facilities team at UChicago to sustainability offices at these peer institutions. And what we came up with was really four key interventions that we wanted to study to see how they might manifest at UChicago and what savings in terms of water and money it might bring us. We came up with what was retrofitting old residence halls that haven't been retrofitted in a long time, retrofitting Ratner, which it turns out is a really big water user. That's our main gym. Um, and then also getting students involved with trailless dining and residential campaigns, uh, residential competitions with behavioral uh, interventions. So first, the retrofitting residence halls. Turns out UChicago uh, prides itself on its beautiful old architecture, but this means that a lot of the student dorms are pretty old buildings. We're thinking uh, uh, Snell Hitchcock, Burton Judson, and Max Pawlowski in particular are uh, places where the water using appliances like toilets, urinals, and showers, and sinks haven't been updated in a while. And so to start, we wanted to, um, we, we were able to get sort of rudimentary floor plans for these schools and just count the number of appliances and then go based off facilities information of how much water each of those appliances used to get an estimate of the um, our current water consumption per building. And then looking at potential substitutions 
uh, get an estimate of how much water um, retrofitting could save us. And so you'll see here, we found that the total cost of retrofitting these residence halls, that's Snell Hitchcock, BJ, and Max P, was about 140,000, um, but that would save us about 3 million gallons, uh, as well as about you know 34,000 in water uh, utility savings. And I think what we were also thinking is these amenities um, specifically, like I said, sinks, showers, toilets, and urinals, they don't last forever and they have to be updated sometime. And so this is a this is a pretty, it's a process that has to happen anyway and is a way to, if we're proactive about it, save a lot of water. Our second intervention was with Ratner Gym. Uh, I love to work out in Ratner, maybe some of you do too, but when you are on the elliptical or whatever, you're probably not thinking about all of the water that gets used by students from showering to laundry to um, just everything required to keep our uh, sports program running. And so for Ratner, we looked at retrofitting all of the, the toilets, urinals, and sinks, um, but we also wanted to look at one of those opportunities for innovation in the form of a liquid solar pool cover that would uh, save water because it's a more sustainable way of covering the pool um, while also keeping swimmers safe and keeping our pool top quality for our swim team. I'll admit uh, I'm a little out of my depth, pun unintended, right now because Jillian's actually on the swim team and so she can speak with enormous enthusiasm about the pool cover. I just know the uh, sort of basics of implementing it for sustainability. But overall, our Ratner gym analysis was uh, was pretty interesting. As you can see, it's it's relatively cheap to make these uh, the, these changes, particularly the solar pool cover, which only costs about $2,000. Um, but the annual water savings would be 140,000 gallons. With the retrofitting as a little more costly um, at $10,000, um, $10,600. But if you'll notice, because of the amount of water that we'd be saving, it actually only costs a cent per gallon saved. And so we thought that was a really interesting result. Ruby, I know that um, that this was the pool cover was sort of Jillian's um, focus, but can you just quickly tell us what the a liquid solar pool cover is? I can do my best. So um, my understanding is that a liquid solar pool cover as an alternative to those sort of big clunky plastic pool covers you might see everywhere from the Chicago pool to your pool at home. Um, it's really a way to um, avoid attracting the sun's heat to pool water and reducing water evaporation at night to um, to sort of keep everything in the temperature that we want it to be and to avoid the loss in water that's created by overnight evaporation from a typical pool with a typical color cover. It's also um, pretty, they, they, they last about a week, but you can um, like add it you add it every every week or so. And so it's sort of an ongoing maintenance process, but um, we actually were able to talk to some, some schools that have used these covers and, um, you know, for Jillian's interest, talk to the dive teams, the people who are really up, up close and personal and they all really, really like it. Um, and so we, we came away thinking it was maybe a very worthwhile investment, both for sustainability and just for athletic quality. Great, thank you so much. So um, my pet intervention, because I, I like things that are low cost and high return, was trayless dining. And this is something that has been uh, implemented with really remarkable success at a few of our peer institutions and has resulted in pretty incredible water savings at virtually no cost. And so uh, if you've had the pleasure of dining at Kathy or um, North's Dining Hall, uh, Chicago's food is... Um, well, it's college dining hall food, but um, it's better than all the other schools I visited. And so it's a, it's a fun part of first year experience, but washing everyone's trays every time they use the dining hall uh, is, a, is a really a huge loss of water. And in fact, what we realized reading these reports from other institutions is that trays weren't adding much to um, people's dining experience. And in fact, people really seem to just grab them because they're there, um, they're, not, they're not a necessity. And so removing trays in dining halls across campus, which could be accomplished in partnership with student sustainability organizations like UCA and the Phoenix Sustainability Initiative, um, it would be a negligible cost, but it has the potential to save about 2 million gallons 
per year. And so we thought this was really impressive. Also a really good opportunity to get students a little bit more involved. Um, I've been involved in sustainability advocacy on campus the past few years. And one thing I hear a lot from students is concern about sustainability in the dining halls, whether it's food waste or the use of some plastic utensils. And so this is also a way to get students invested in our sustainability efforts, make them feel like they're making a difference because they genuinely are. And more on the student involvement side, we also conducted a literature review of behavioral interventions for water conservation. Uh, UChicago is a notoriously quirky place. We're a place where students are invested in the university's identity. And we also want our water plan to reflect that. So it's not just happening in the background of students' lives. It's happening um, in, their, in their daily lives, in their houses, in their dorm bathrooms, et cetera. And so uh, from the literature review, two possible behavior interven interventions that have been very successful in generating water conservation in the past were competition between residence halls. You don't get to use Chicago without being a, without wanting to outdo all the other kids who get used Chicago. So we thought that this one would be good for us. And then informational campaigns that just raise people's awareness about the water they're using on a daily basis. Um, based on the literature review, we thought that we could expect a two to 5% reduction in water usage in the dorms with a quarter long competition between the residence halls. And we also really wanted to pay attention because we were conducting this project during a pandemic, that there are important social co-benefits to challenging students to reduce their water usage in collaboration with their house and their neighbors um, against other dorms. We wanted to create a sense of community around sustainability during a time where frankly, at all colleges, community can feel like a hard to find thing. Um, again, uh, these kinds of competitions, low cost, high impact, there's really minimal investment in generating them and the potential for not just water savings, but also um, just generating a better culture of sustainability. Our informational campaign, we think it would be effective to add prompts in bathrooms, which have been tied to concrete water conservation in the past emails from authority figures like resident deans, but also familiar figures like resident heads. And then my favorite, UChicago specific messaging that builds on things like the life of the mind um, and things working in theory, but not practice to have students get a little bit of an insider group feeling. And so they're genuinely invested. Um, and yeah, uh, I figured Mark and I could tag team this one. Our other person, Anika, who is also on the water team and has been carrying the torch for Jillian and I moving forward, um, is also out today. And so we are sort of wanted to give you all a sense of the future of water at UChicago. Um, and so I, I can sort of give what I think Anika might have been talking about. Um, which involved a lot of economic modeling to understand how this plan, uh, what we hope is a plausible plan to achieve our 15% reduction by 2025, what it would actually mean in terms of costs and savings more than our sort of rough model demonstrated. So getting a more, taking a step towards more concrete implementation. Um, and we want to just develop this plan so it's implementable. And um, I know that Anika is also conducting additional research, uh, really under Sabina's guidance, guidance. This is something that Sabina has worked on a lot personally and has talked to us a lot about on the social cost of water. So we can understand what, what water conservation uh, means for our community and really what else is lost when we use water. Mark, would you mind jumping in? I think you can probably speak better to the more recent updates. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, it's really wonderful work that's been done and it's been it's been fun kind of building off of that. So just, you know, as, as Ruby was saying, we were we've been focused in the winter a lot on sort of the economic uh, financial model that facilities can use in the future on any water projects and and in the upcoming spring, uh, this spring quarter, what we're working on is kind of drafting a rough water reduction plan uh, for facilities, services, and the Office of Sustainability to use in order to kind of guide the future uh, water conservation measures. And that's, the, we saw the top WCMs were, as Ruby mentioned, in the residence halls, in athletic facilities, and in lab buildings. So we've just been going through and doing performing write-ups for each WCM within these respective buildings and category of buildings. 
And again, we have been conducting more research on the social impact of water and kind of how much are we actually saving when we're saving water as there's other costs associated with just the actual water itself and kind of the treatment and the, the entire procurement process. And then again, we're just finalizing a water reduction plan for the Office of Sustainability to continue using for the future projects that are related to water. Great, thank you, Ruby, and thank you, Mark. Um, any questions about water conservation on campus or this research effort? I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank the water team for and everyone, but the water team for for the work and um, to echo Ruby's point about um, how we're now Mark and um, Anika and I are looking into the the social cost of water to try to measure the uh, benefits from water conservation. Thanks so much, Sabina. Thank you everyone for joining. I know that Earth Week can kind of um, put us up against really, really big challenges like climate change and water depletion worldwide. And I think it's a really lovely reminder that sustainability starts in our campus community. Um, it's really inspiring to see all the other students present as well. I'll also just post the full calendar of our Earth Day events um, in the chat for everybody who hasn't, I'm sure you've all seen it by now, but if you haven't seen it, um, there's a lot happening this week and beyond, so. Including this afternoon, or Anne, sorry, did you have a question? Uh, no, I just was gonna say, there's a really great article about um, Sabina today in the oh. news. I'm sure you love that I'm sharing this, but it also calls out Environmental Frontiers Initiative. So I thought everyone should recognize we're getting nice visibility this week for all the work we put in. Thank you. I didn't realize this had come out. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's out. Thank you. That's great. I was, I was going to do another uh, sort of uh, cheerlead moment this afternoon. Another Earth Week event that's happening, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is the introduction of a virtual sustainability tour that Sabina and Sarah have also been working on a campus sustainability tour at like one o'clock. Yeah, I don't take any credit for that, but um, Sarah and Adam and the facilities team, um, Freddie, have been working with Chicago Studies, and so there'll be a virtual tour um, released this afternoon on the Chicago Studies website, and um, a whole bunch of other sustainability things happening this week with Chicago Studies, so um, it's worth checking out their page, too. Um, I just think it's a nice tie-in uh, for folks who are here who have now heard about labs and lead building and water usage in different spaces on campus, um, you know, the sustainability tour will have a whole other layer of that depth to it, which is kind of neat. Um, we're just a minute over time. Um, I cannot emphasize enough to the students how fantastic you are. Um, really impressive, both in terms of the caliber of your research um, and also your presentations. Um, and you're just a true pleasure to work with. And we appreciate all your contributions to, um, you know, moving campus in a more sustainable direction. Um, any other closing thoughts or sentiments before we say goodbye? Great. Well, hopefully, um, if we were in person, we would, you know, have pastries and coffee right now, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that um, before the academic year is done. Um, but enjoy the rest of Earth Week. Thank you all. Thank you to um, attendees for joining and listening in. And uh, yeah, talk to you soon. Yes, and thank you, Diana. For thank everything. you. Thank you, Diana. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.